So I've told you already, there's two types of cardiac muscle cells with different types of action potentials. I'm gonna start with the type that is in the bulk of the, mus the heart muscle um, here as well. I'm trying to get the, the atria in there as well. So the myocardium, um, it contains these contractile cells, right? It has to contract. This is 99% of the cells in the heart that are, they're designed to contract. That's their job. And they have a certain type of action potential. These are gonna be our myocardial cells. Is another term for them. The other cells that we will talk about are going to be our generators. So the pacemakers, there are two nodes. I'm just gonna draw with little bundles for now. You'll see a picture later where they're drawn a little bit more accurately. One's kind of at the top of the heart and one's um, in between the atria and ventricles. These are nodes where there are pacemaker cells. These are also called, called autorhythmic, which I will spell wrong. I cannot spell the word rhythmic. I think I did it. Awesome. Um, so this is about 1% of the, of the cells, but they're really important. And these are what spontaneously contract without any nervous input. So that's how a heart can contract outside of a body until it runs out of oxygen. Um, pretty cool. These cells are going to tell the rest of the heart initiate contraction for the rest of the heart. So let's start with these ones because um, they're a little more relevant to compare to skeletal muscle, which we just talked about action potentials and those refractory periods in skeletal muscle. So starting with the myocytes, this is our cardiac muscle cell, our contractile cells. Just to remind us, this is 99% of the cardiac of the heart muscle, heart cardiac muscle um, cells. They're also called contractile cells because they're the ones that contract. So what is this gonna look like? Well, of course, we're gonna have some differences compared to our normal action potential. Um, first of all, we are going to start a little lower, but I don't have anything written on my axis here yet, so it doesn't really matter. Um, we are going to depolarize. I'm gonna draw this and then I will label my axis here. So we're starting about minus 90, a little bit lower than your skeletal muscle, definitely lower than a neuron. Um, not super important, I'm not really big into the numbers. Our peak here is still gonna be about 30 up here plus 30. So we've got zero somewhere around here. Okay, what is initiating this depolarization? It's going to be different than um, our skeletal muscle, right? It's not a motor neuron. In these contractile cells, where are they getting the message from? Hopefully you're thinking pacemakers pacemakers are initiating the heart rhythm. So it's actually gonna be coming in, the, the ions are coming in, right? Positively charged ions come in to reach threshold and then open more voltage gated sodium channels. The initiator for this is going to be through gap junctions. Does that make sense? Based on what I told you about gap junctions before, they connect the cardiac muscle cells electrically. So this might be a gap junction from a pacemaker cell, but if this is a cell that's down like at the base, I'm sorry, the apex of the heart, kind of the bottom, which is the apex, um, it's gonna receive a message from another cardiac cell, contractile cell that's right next to it. So that all those contractile cells are going to contract almost instantaneously at the same time, simultaneously the word I mean. So gap junctions are going to um, allow positive ions in, right? When we reach threshold, so 
we got right here, let's just say threshold reached. So probably around minus 40 to 50 again. This is gonna cause our voltage gated um, sodium channels to open. Just like a regular action potential, right? That's how action potentials always work. That part's gonna be pretty consistent. Sodium is going to brush into the cell, of course, right? Then we're gonna have some things that are a little different here as we reach this peak. First, when we get to the top, um, we are gonna have our potassium channels open, but I'm just gonna draw this for you first, then I'll explain it. What? Oops, that's, I don't like how that looked. Don't like how that looks either. Let's do try one more time. This shape here is what I wanna emphasize here. So we do have potassium channels opening. Fast ones open here, potassium goes out. So why don't we have repolarization? Well, it turns out we also have another type of cell um, channel that are going to open. We're also gonna have calcium channels open. When calcium channels open, which way does calcium flow? You might remember from your vesicle, calcium dependent vesicle transmission that there's higher calcium outside of the cell than inside the cell. Um, so calcium is gonna flow into the cell. Potassium is flowing out, calcium is flowing in. That's gonna cause this prolonged depolarization because inward flow is balancing outward flow. So this is time point, let's say two, three, right about here, calcium channels open right around just after potassium channels open. We then have back here, slower, potassium channels open. This delay is the cause of this, this delay. Now we have more potassium flowing out and finally our repolarization. So the important thing here is that prolonged um, Depolarization that is due to calcium channels opening. That's the unique thing too, right? This is what's unique compared to skeletal muscle. That's going to cause a longer lasting action potential before we can have that repolarization occur. So the consequence of this is we're gonna have a longer lasting action potential um, and a longer lasting refractory period. So let's actually look at that on my other um, image here. Let's go over here. This is the same thing I just drew. So looking at these contractile cells, this scale here um, is still in milliseconds, but we're looking, I mean, you can see visually that it's longer. So the values look very similar, but then we've got this prolonged action potential is actually this entire thing. Um, I know I told you one to two milliseconds, right, for skeletal muscle. This whole thing is closer to 100 milliseconds instead of one to two milliseconds. So what that means is the refractory period is also prolonged, right? I mean, can you see that? You can't have another action potential occur until you get back down here. This is your absolute refractory period. Absolutely can't do another one. This is your relative refractory period. That's amazing, you even could have another action potential there, but um, it takes a large stimulus. Um, and so this is really important 
because you can't have another action potential occur until the first action potential is on its way down. It's, it's becoming, um, it's ending. Actually, I think I have tension show up here. So it's a review of the mechanisms that are occurring here. And here's our tension. So here is our um, timing here. This is actually over 300 milliseconds until we get back down here. So you cannot have another action potential occur and generate tension in a cardiac muscle until a minimum of 200 milliseconds. That would take a large stimulus, 250 milliseconds. That's 0.25 seconds. You actually can do the math and that's about 220 beats per minute, which is the absolute fastest human's heart's beat. Um, and that is because of this refractory period. You don't want to have summation occur in your cardiac muscle, like in, in tetanus, that would be bad. Tetanus, right? Um, that's not going to efficiently pump blood. You wanna be able to really control this pump, relax, pump, relax, and have that be um, more consistent. And the absolute fastest you can do that is 220 per minute. Even then it is um, relaxing in between each beat, but actually um, there can be consequences to your heart beating that fast. You're not gonna actually be pumping blood quite as efficiently in some cases. Okay, so I hope it's clear what the significance of this prolonged action potential is on cardiac muscle function and also then the cause of this prolonged action potential. So let's do a learning check here. Which image here shows skeletal muscles? Which one shows the cardiac myocytes, the contractile cells? All right, here's our skeletal muscle. Here is our contractile cardiac. And here kind of side by side, you can really see the timing a lot better. This is close to like one millisecond. This one is closer to, I think I said 100 milliseconds. In reality, this whole thing is actually um, closer to 300 milliseconds. And then the significance is when you can generate a second um, amount of tension, you, you can sum here, you could have a second active potential right here and add on to this one. Can't do that here. You cannot have another active potential occur until at least this time point on here. You cannot have um, significant summation <clears throat> and you cannot have tetanus occur. Okay, last one I'm gonna do in a separate video, um, last for action potentials is the pacemaker cells, which are super cool.